So the second paper is kind of a much, wor much more of a, of a work in progress. It's also with uh, Mathilde Ray uh, and Francesco Trebi and, and Bright Hakkinen, who uh, was a PhD student at, at Vancouver. Um, and in here, we are moving away from lawmaking, looking at the rulemaking process, and considering very much the same corporate philanthropy data, but trying to highlight a very separate mechanism of influence via the corporate philanthropy again. Okay? All right. So here, we're going to shift our focus to issues of information and uh, how this information is influencing policymaking. So obviously, when we think about regulators, as they're trying to make, quote unquote, the right decision, um, they are going to be in need of information about the costs and benefits of all the different alternatives they could be putting into place. And you know, very often, especially when you think about the regulation of business, we think that corporations have got a lot of information that's going to be relevant to the, the, the regulators as they make those decisions. But we also obviously believe that these corporations may have an incentive to provide biased information and you know, to try to kind of shape the, the decision of the rule makers in ways that are much more consistent with the interests of the corporation. And in that context, you know, we have a large literature in, in theory literature, like the work that Matthias has been doing and, and Jean, that suggests that when these um, decision makers have access to more diverse information, they're going to be making better decisions, right? So nonprofits could be an important part of diversifying the set of information that regulators are using when deciding whether or not to write a rule this way or that way. Right. And there are really two ways you can think about how nonprofits kind of could help um, the decision maker make better decisions. On the one hand, you can imagine nonprofits are going to come and provide information that's going to be unbiased. Right? So if you think about, you know, the Cochrane Review tells us, you know, kind of this is what the medical research says. Right? Kind of an idea of unbiased information provi provided by a nonprofit. You could also imagine that nonprofits also have their own bias. But that's going to be nice because that's going to be cancel out the bias of the corporation. So think about the Sierra Club and its advocacy for you know, environment conservation. It's probably biased, but it might be helping undo the bias of the corporation. They're going to tell us that oil is not bad for, you know, for the environment and climate change is not man-made. All right? Now, distortions could be happening if these rule makers are making decisions get this information from the nonprofits, but do not understand that these nonprofits have themselves their own biases because they are receiving grants from, uh, from corporations. Okay? So this is what we're going to be you know, trying to study. Right? Now, there's you know, anecdotal evidence that this happens. And what we're going to try to do here is to try to make this more systematic. The kind of anecdotal evidence, if you, you, know, if you search the newspapers, you know, kind of will be like the two anecdotes over here. So, there's this story about the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry that changed its position about soft drinks and whether or not they were bad for uh, your kid's teeth after receiving a million dollars from the Coke Foundation. Not the Koch Brothers, the Coca-Cola Foundation. Uh, there's this just hilarious um, newspaper story about at and that was actually kind of trying to encourage homeless shelters they were giving money to, to get the homeless people to write to the FEC, F FCC so that they would not oppose a merger that ATT was trying to do with T-Mobile. So they don't always do this very smartly. But the, these stories, you know, very much exist. Our goal is to try to say, is there something systematic here? Okay? All right. So, so we do, do the following. Again, just recapping the questions. Do, the co do corporations systematically employ the charitable giving in a way that is aligned with their interest in regulating matters? I'm going to prevent, prevent a few tests of that. And then in this paper, we, we are trying, but that is very much you know, still a work in progress, to try to get at the pro quo part. Is there any evidence that this matters? Is there any evidence that regulators start writing different kinds of regulations because of this influence? Okay? And I'll show you what we've done, and I'll tell you about what we're trying to do to try to do this um, better. All right, so first, just a bit of you know, institutional background, see if that's something you're not familiar with. So, so remember, lawmaking, they pass a law, and then the law basically like, you know, ends up then on, you know, on the desk of the, the, the regulatory agencies, and those regulatory agencies have got to write rules that will reflect the law. 
And there's a lot that happened in this process, right? Again, the Dodd-Frank was the best example of like a law that looked like he had some teeth when it came out of Congress, but was essentially kind of destroyed via the rulemaking process. So how does the rulemaking process happen? Well, a regulatory agency would write a proposed rule and then would open that rule to comments. Comments that can come from you, me, corporations, uh, educators, nonprofits, all of that. Okay? And there's a fixed time period for these comments to be received. And then the regulatory agencies has got to revise the rule that they've written, okay, uh, in response to these comments. Okay? And if they don't make changes to the rule in response to a particular comment, they're going to have to try to explain why. All right? So that's kind of the rulemaking process in the US uh, in a nutshell. Now, what's nice is that there's no data again, digitized data that allows us to start to get inside of this process. So in particular, um, there's a website called regulations.gov, which is a depository for everything rulemaking since 2003. And you know, it's more complete today than it was in 2003 with more and more agencies kind of like sharing. But essentially, it's a website where you can find millions and millions of comments that were made by firms, individuals, uh, in tens of thousands of dockets. So think about a docket as being a particular rule. It's a bit of a simplification, but a docket would be, you know, would be a rule. And in onregulation.gov, you have all of the text of the comments, and you also have the proposed rules, the final rule, notices that the agency would have submitted. So this data is right there, and what we're going to try to do is exploit it in combination with the corporate philanthropy data that I've already introduced to you uh, before. All right, so so how did we build this data set? As you can imagine this get very quickly unwieldy in terms of you know, the size that this could take. So let me just take you very you know, clearly through what we did. So we started with a set of corporate foundations because this paper was down second, we actually had more time to collect more corporate foundations. So we took every company that was in the S&P 500 or Fortune 500 between 1995 and 2016 and traced the corporate foundations associated with this corporation and got all of the 990 data for all of the grants that these corporate foundations uh, had been making. Um, then we um, essentially kind of took all these comments, these millions and millions of comments, and linked these comments to a particular corporation or a particular nonprofit. Okay? And then we ended up with the following sample. A sample of about 900 firms, about half of which have a corporate foundation attached to it. And a sample of 11,000 nonprofits that appear at least once in the corporate giving data and appear at least once in the common data. Right? So, this is not the whole universe of nonprofits. This would be just impossible to do. Our data set is a set of nonprofits that make at least one comment you know, in, the federal, um, in the federal system and receive at least one grant from the hundreds of corporations that, uh, that we follow. All right. Okay, so um, we're going to look at um, a set of things. In particular, we're going to be interested in the likelihood of co-commenting. And that's going to be essentially the likelihood, you know, of dummy variability equals one, if a particular corporation and a particular non-profit are both sending comments on the same dockets, on the same rules. All right. So what are the tests that we perform? The first one is, you know, kind of obviously because it is time invariant, the weakest one. And this one is simply asking, is the likelihood of co-commenting between a nonprofit and a corporation higher if the corporation made charitable gift to the nonprofit? Right? So define across all of the regulations that we have access to, a dummy variable that equals one, if a corporation and a nonprofit comment on the same rule, yeah? and then ask, and particularly whether this likelihood of co-commenting is higher when there's evidence of a financial link between the corporation and the nonprofit. Okay? So that's time invariant, has all the problems you could imagine because it's time invariant, but let's start with that. And obviously you can do this by controlling for foundation slash firm fixed effects and for grantee fixed effects, and there's no doubt there's a very strong positive relationship there. But this could obviously be, you know, sector specific, right? So 
um, a corporation that is, you know, in agriculture, is a non-profit that covers agricultural matters, they're most likely to more co comment on the same kind of rules by the USDA, and they're also more likely to have financial links, right? So you have to push beyond the time invariant. This is what we do in the time variant specification. And there, what is it that we're just exploiting information about the timing of those donations, right? So here, what are we asking? You know, kind of, what is the likelihood that a given for-profit and a given non-profit are commenting on the same rules as a function of whether the firm made a gift to the non-profit in that year or the year immediately preceding, which you can then kind of regress on a bunch of fixed effects, but in particular, fixed effects for the non-profit for-profit pair. Right? which takes away the average tendency of a corporation and, non and a non-profit to comment on the same matters and you know, kind of have gifts, financial links with one another. Okay? So in this model, again, you know, and the last discussion is the one you're going to prefer because it has this grantee firm pair, you find again this positive relationship. So see just the size of this data set. Again, you know, how do you get there? Think about all the dockets times the number of non-profits times the numbers of foundation, right? This is why these data sets really exploit um, really quickly. All right. So the existence of a financial link increases the likelihood of co-commenting. Now, we can push this further. In order to push this further, we're going to start using some text analysis tool. So don't push me on the text analysis tool because I just have no idea how they work. I just know they happen. Uh, all right. So Beyond just kind of evidence of co-commenting, what's going to be much more interesting is whether there's a sense that what they're saying is related. Right? So here's an example of the kind of thing we try to capture. Here's Bank of America. Bank of America made a gift to the Green Lining Institute in 2010, and both the Green Lining Institute and B of A made comments on one particular rule that came out of Dodd-Frank. Okay? And here's part of the language that is in these comments. Okay. What we're going to try to do is essentially ask whether there's more similarity between the language that the for-profit and the non-profit are using when they comment on a particular rule when there is existence of a financial link between the two. Does that make sense? Yes. No. Uh, we're going to do this in terms of the tool, kind of off-the-shelf tool so far, they use bag of words, and you know, kind of when you deploy your tool, you end up with a metric for every non-profit for-profit pair that would have value between minus one and one, where one would be greatest similarity between the two. Okay, so that's the exercise, and again, the regression then is simply when you've got this non-profit and for-profit financial link. Is there evidence that there's more similarity in the language that is being used in the comments of the two uh, partner in the pair? And these are the results, and this suggests a positive relationship. Okay, so now this is where you know the limits of text analysis for research kind of becomes very clear. Because as you can imagine, I could have two comments that are very, very similar, but one says do this, and then one says do not do this. And they're gonna sound very, very similar. Right? So this is kind of where we are with the paper, is just trying to push that further. Now, the one thing that we've done so far is do the following, which is to do sentiment analysis. This is very crude as well, but on every comment that you receive, you can do a sentiment analysis based on the words in the comment. So that means you can do sentiment analysis also and compare the sentiment of a document by for-profit and non-for-profit and ask whether the sentiment is more similar when there's evidence of a donation or the opposite. And what we find is uh, evidence, if anything, of more similarity. So the worry that you know, we find more similarity, but it's because one says do this and the other one says do not do this, uh, you know, would suggest that we would have very opposite sentiment. We find, if anything, you know, the opposite. But that's still very crude. Okay. And now let me take you to the very final thing that, that we are doing in the paper. And, and this is where we think there's, there could be some wins in terms of like pushing the research, but we are still a long way uh, from, from all we know. But this is one of the case where we could do the pro quo part. Why could we do the pro quo part here? Well, because we see the initial rule and we see the revised rule. 
right? So as you go from the initial rule to the revised rule, you get potentially a way to assess how much the political process was influenced by this slow game that I just described. And we are, you know, we try to do this. So how, how do we proceed so far? Again, same of the shelf text analysis tool. But we are really now trying to kind of train algorithms to do this much more in a much more uh, refined way. But for the sake of showing where we are, you know, here's, um, here's an example. This is a comment that Wells Fargo made, um, and um, which you can read the extract off. And here, this is the regulators discussing the changes they made to the final rule in light of the comments they received by Wells Fargo and all the other people that commented. So what we're going to do is again comparing language similarity, but now not between the non-profits and the for-profit, but between the for-profit comments and the regulators' discussion of the comment that they received. And we're going to, you know, kind of say that if there's more similarity between these two documents, when there's evidence of non-profits that are grantees of Wells Fargo also commenting in this process, that would be evidence of the pro quo part. Does that make sense? Right, so this is the very, you know, the very final test that we perform. So again, what's the similarity between the discussion of the rule by the regulator and the comments that were made by the firm on the particular rule? And that is a dummy variable that equals one if at least one of the grantee from this firm received money in the current year of the T minus one. Does that make sense? And the sign suggests that indeed there is evidence of more similarity in the comments when, um, when um, there's a non-profit that provide quote unquote support to the corporation on the commenting front, maybe because of the financial link. Right. So as I said, this is something that we want to push. I think there's, there's a, a very aggressive way to interpret this as in a less aggressive way. I think the less aggressive way, which I feel like I can state now, is that this suggests, at the very least, the regulators are paying more attention to Wells Fargo when there are these, you know, kind of all the nonprofits that are commenting at the same time, grantees of Wells Fargo. Obviously, the more aggressive way is that the Wells Fargo comments receive more weight and influence the rewriting of the rules uh, in case where um, the regulators are receiving similar you know, push for nonprofits that are grantees of these, uh, of these corporations. All right. So, so what have we, you know, what have we done? I think I've said, I said all these things. So maybe I'll just, I'll just do the, 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 the final, the final slide. And, and what do we do with this work? So, I mean, the goal of this research is, you know, to, treat, to really try to understand better the process of influence, um, in, in political economy. I think, you know, kind of making the link maybe more directly to this conference than I've, than I've so far, I think, you know, if you live in the U.S. right now, there's sort of a sense that, you know, kind of our democratic institutions are not working, and there's a strong sense that a lot of these mechanisms of political influence very much, you know, related to, you know, kind of some individuals because they are richer having more voice, some corporations because they are richer having more voice are important, and we really need to understand these mechanisms. Uh, and really, our goal here is just just try to expand the set of, of of influence mechanism that we think about, and really go in an area that I think typically you know kind of corporations, rich families get good publicity for, but actually you know might be a really hidden form of influence. So we're really trying to open uh, to open this box, and we'll be very clear that there's really nothing that you know we've done here that suggests that philanthropy is only used you know, strategically like this. Obviously, there's other reasons why corporations, individuals engage in philanthropy, but these, these political mechanisms are important one. One of the things that, you know, I would love to do, we would love to do is, is extend this beyond uh, corporate philanthropy, but look at individual philanthropy as well, right? So the same website where we have information on all of these corporate foundations also have all the big family foundations. So you can have a good sense of where all of the Forbes people are, you know, kind of making their um, the gifts and trying to get a handle as to how much of that individual philanthropy is also driven by ulterior motives. Uh, I think it's really something that, you know, we, we would very much like, you know, like to do and is on is all, on, on, on all to do uh, all to do this. But as a bottom line, just, um, you know, I think our, our work at least, you know, puts 
some somewhat more ambiguous spin on on the idea that you know corporate philanthropy is good you know is good for society and again that's also important in the context of an environment where a lot of the pushback against more taxation for corporation is that even taxation for rich individuals is that these people give back through other ways like the ways that we you know that we describe okay and i'm going to stop here There, about the second paper, yeah. there's something I'm wondering. Uh, I mean, it's not um, you show that the, basically the uh, private firms influence non-profit, and uh, and that when they give uh, money to, uh, money to the non-profit, then they basically tend to share the same views or perhaps influence them. That that's uh, fair enough. But one thing that may enfin, do you think it's going to be the case first and if yes uh, it might be the case interesting to to look at that do you think the the private firms could influence the non-profit in the following sense that they could change their their behavior for instance the non-profit is usually uh, in favor of defend defending the environment and suddenly it's going to become uh, let's say a much more uh, reasonable or much more moderate so do you think you, there is that, and could you sh show it with time variation, or perhaps by um, finding uh, similar uh, non-profits that uh, usually behave the same, and after a donation, they stop behaving the same, or perhaps uh, one is going to uh, intervene in the comment, and the other one is not going to make any comment, yeah. you see? Yeah, so that's great, it's a great question. So do I believe that I could make a uh, green piece stop you know being pro oil you know if i give me some money I, I don't probably believe that but so some of the anecdotes that i started with suggest that you know positions might change maybe not in an extreme way there's nothing in the paper so far that really allows us to look at that right a lot of this could be driven by simply having you know a more moderate environmental group you know expressing their views well you know, otherwise it would have been they would have been silent so it's more kind of a not an organization changing its views, but really who participates in the political process. And there's really nothing that we've done in the paper so far, even though that's the direction we should go in, that allows us to, you know, to look at that, uh, to look at that very well. Um, the, um, I think you also mentioned something else, which is what I, what, what I call the, the, the hush money. And we have a section of the paper <coughs> to discuss that. The idea that by making a grant to, say, Greenpeace, you may not get them to say something pro oil, but you may make them just not comment. Um, so that's something that we explored actually in the paper, and we didn't find any evidence for. So these are all, these are all great questions and just things that, you know, on the to-do list. Maybe not for this paper, but, you know, very fair questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wonder whether I wonder if you explore the heterogeneity by the type of regulators. So basically, can you tell us which uh, areas are more corruptible, which are less, and uh, how yeah. big the, is the difference? So this is, this is why we are you know, kind of spending right now a lot of time on trying to see whether we can do the last, the very last part of the paper better in a way that you know, goes beyond the you know, off-the-shelf um, language analysis tool. Because I feel, we feel like if we can do that and really convince you that we have, you know, something strong there in terms of the pro pro part, then it opens the door to doing exactly the kind of stuff that you want. So that's why we're making this investment, trying to do this better. But we are part of that. Lots of people reading, reading roles right now. Thank you. Sorry, in this data, do you have uh, information about foreign entities um, it's only domestic so anything that comes yes so I I, I know I know where you're going uh, <laughs> uh, yeah no <laughs> but there's lots of I mean again so I, and, and I'm I don't know how far one can go I mean I think a lot of the anecdotes are there about all the foreign money going to think tanks in the U.S., Brookings, you know, there was a lot of stories about that. That would be something super interesting to do. But that, we're going to need another data set than this one. Because this is not uh, Yes. Um, 
some of it, yeah, so I don't know, I don't know the limit. I don't know the limit of, you know, if I start not from, so again, my approach here now is to start from the, the donor and then figure out who the grantees are. There are also some data sets, but it's less systematic where you can start from the nonprofit, say the think tank, and figure out who their donors are. But I do not believe this is as systematic as we can do in you know, the opposite direction. Yeah, here. Oh, yeah. So where do corporations learn to do this? If it's such a strategic element of, of, bus of doing business, you would expect some of that to be in the curriculum of business schools and so on. <laughs> Have you tried to look at that? It's funny because I teach this stuff in business school. <laughs> um. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think that there's, there's, no, there's no doubt that when <coughs> in business school they teach uh, kind of strategic CSR, right? Strategic corporate social responsibility, they would talk about how you can make money by, you know, kind of pretending that your coffee was grown on a farm where there's no child abuse going on. And that's obviously another way of using corporate philanthropy as a way to make money. Mine is for local, but it doesn't seem to be a big leap to go from, you know, from like, you know, giving money to farmers in Costa Rica to be able to raise the price of your coffee to, you know, kind of doing this for local angle. Yep. Here, or there's two people. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I just want to know if um, how does this combine with gerrymandering, um, in the sense of the the change of the limits of the electoral districts in the U.S. Yeah. And if you found evidence that these corporations or foundations play a role in gerrymandering. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I think it's just, you could view, if you view gerrymandering as being another thing that could be legislated, then it would be just another kind of outcome that could be, you know, that could be affected. Uh, I mean, the interaction with gerrymandering of what we do, I mean, what gerrymandering does is that it basically reduces the amount of operational districts that are, that are close, right? It makes them more one or the other. So then, you know, I guess one of your approach question would be to say, is there any evidence that these effects are stronger for members of Congress that are more, you know, kind of, uh, that face a certain likelihood of not being re-elected? So looking at close elections, and we did not find it, it to matter. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you started this talk with this uh, puzzle that there is uh, not enough money in politics. And so I was wondering whether you think that uh, the channels you're, you've shown us can account uh, for the full money in politics, or if it, if it doesn't, there is more that uh, we need. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is just, I think this is, this is one, you know, this is one angle. I mean, I think the idea is just, you know, just, just to think, you know, let's think a bit more. I mean, even like the mechanisms like revolving doors, I don't feel like we have a good sense of like how much, you know, how much corporations are really spending on revolving door, or how much they are wasting by, you know, hiring the son or daughter of a particular politician that doesn't know how to do anything uh, but giving them a job. So I think just, just saying, you know, kind of, we get too focused on just lobbying and campaign contributions. We should be more creative. This is one way. I'm sure there are many other ways. Yeah. Um, related to Katia's question and the second part of your presentation, would you be able to perform a simple topic model so as, so as to extract the main topics of the different comments and then maybe it could help you to characterize the most effective, I mean the most influential comments? Yes, yes, this is again on the list, on the list of things that we're trying to do as we're trying to refine those tools. You mentioned in your motivation how you get to this site because you wanted to know yeah. who are the donor of the University yeah. of Chicago. Did you find them? Oh no, I know who the donors are. I'm just, you know, I, I'm still, I, I don't still have a good answer as to like the full motivations behind these people's desire to give money to us or any other university for that matter. Uh, and again, I think that would be just, as, as I said, this is more compliment to like, this is really focused on corporate philanthropy. I think a lot is happening also with individual philanthropy. I mean, again, 
tons of anecdotes recently in the US where you can give grants to get your kids into you know, good colleges uh, and things like that. So you just, you know, it's, it's an area that is not being you know, studied, studied enough and it would be nice to do that. But just you know, kind of to give you an example of why we struggle with the, the individual philanthropy data, um, Michael Dale has got a huge foundation, the Dale Foundation, but it's much harder to figure out what his objectives are compared to like the objective of Dell as a corporation. I mean, for me, understanding what is in the interest of Dell as a corporation, I have some traction on that because I know what they're lobbying on. Michael Dell, I'm not so sure. So that's why I think the individual of data is being much harder to, you know, to, to use or figure out a good research designer. Um, so one, uh, one or two questions. You, you mentioned the fact that a lot of corporate uh, giving uh, was uh, directly, you know, didn't go through this foundation. Yeah. So, do, but isn't it at least re reported separately uh, on the tax form? Uh, yeah. so, 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 so you might sort of have some side on this. So, uh, they, they, um, you might find some information about it if you read their, you know, the, the annual reports or the quarterly reports, but there's absolutely no no need for them to disclose what they are what they are doing. No, but no, I was asking, you, but you know how much it is as a total figure, no? No. But but don't they? So what is the tax treatment of this gift? It's uh, it's deductible from their yeah. from their taxable profits, yeah. but in their so in their so in their balance sheet, it appears as just as if they were buying other uh, intermediate yeah, so inputs. That's a very good question. So I, I actually don't know the precise answer. I've, I've been going under the on the assumption there's not a separate line on the tax form that says, you know, kind of this is because of like direct giving. So, so, so maybe there's, maybe I'm wrong and maybe there's a way if you look at the tax form to figure out how much they give directly, but certainly there's no need to disclose what they, what they spend the money on. Mm -mm. Because if that was just uh, uh, treated as other uh, intermediate uh, inputs, uh, uh, intermediate consumption, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it opens another range of issue, which is that a lot of intermediate consumption, in fact, is, uh, you know, is part of top executive uh, consumption yeah. or is part yeah. of other people yeah. who you help to consume by yeah. paying uh, yeah. business class uh, tickets. Or yeah. so but I would have thought here, yeah, there's, 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 uh, yeah, I don't I, know. But I should, uh, yeah. I should, I should yeah. check. So yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can figure out the number, but I'm pretty yeah. sure you can't figure out yeah. the composition. No, the of composition it. probably. Yeah. And so my other question is, if I uh, come back to your, uh, the first uh, part of your presentation, yeah. so you have the coefficients you get for the corporate uh, philanthropy are way smaller, like yeah. five, six times smaller than those you get yeah. for PAC contribution. But so at the same time, you say corporate philanthropy was how many times bigger? Yeah, uh, but again, but so that's the question so that we get. Yeah, so I think the, the reason why, you know, kind of this question is misleading is that corporate philanthropy is so much more in dollars. So in the end, what do you conclude about the relative importance of the two? So, so you mentioned you have a theoretical model, but you didn't seem yeah, to so trust the, uh, it too well, much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So the, let me just kind of say yeah. in words what the assumptions, what the assumptions of the model are without going into, you know, into it. So the model, you know, kind of assumes that, uh, you know, so I think we, we're trying to figure out how much of the whole CSR is politically motivated. And then the assumption that we make is that politically motivated CSR and PAC have the same elasticities with respect to importance committee. Right? And so if you make that assumption, then figure out, so maybe the model is over here. So here's a model. Here's the production function of, of political influence. A is a factor that shifts whether or not giving to a particular person is productive. So the person is on the relevant committee. And that's C is the political CSR, the political philanthropy, and P is the PAC money. <coughs> Total CSR is a C plus, um, you know, the political CSR is C, the non-political CSR is C delta. And so then from these simple assumptions, you have this kind of maximization of how much PAC and corporate philanthropy you want to give in order to maximize your influence. We make these two assumptions of fixed neutrality and we make this assumption that seems reasonable that non-political CSR does not you know, change as a function of whether or not someone is relevant to your corporation. So if you go from there, then you find that the, um, these are the two coefficients that were bolded, the 0.559 and the 0.09. And then if you combine all of this, that's how you end up with the 16%. 
That's, that's, the, that's the model. And, and so if you believe in that, then this is bigger than the pack. Um, well, yeah. Uh, because the, so here, so you have, you have uh, right. The, the, I, yeah, I don't know what the pack money is, but it's way way smaller. Okay. Well, the pack money is constrained because every corporation yeah. can only give like up to five thousand dollars about per you know per political candidates. Mm -hmm. So lobbying is more is is, is about an order of magnitude bigger than pack money. Mm -hmm. And this is I think this is this is actually the amount of federal lobbying in the U.S. is three billion dollars per year in total. To give you a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's but, you know. Yeah. But, but with the way you you compute this uh, this percentage, you assume that uh, the firm uh, does disregard the, the double dividend. That is, it's also charity, also in terms of image and so on. Uh, Absolutely. So, so uh, that's uh, an upper bound. Yeah. So this one, you know, I'm 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 not a huge fan of this model, uh, but I think it 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 helps in trying to put some magnitude rather than just you know stopping there. That's it. All right, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>